I'm happy that that ChatGPT makes this so obvious. <laughs> that ChatGPT yes. makes it obvious that that these kind of sentences are non-intelligent jargon that they Excellent. are just yes. machine yes. Uh, jargon reproduced. Yes, that, that, that I'm, I'm glad, 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 grateful to ChatGPT that it shows that this language needs zero intelligence. All right, welcome back. I brought Hans Georg Möller back and Johannes Niederhauser back to discuss AI today. The reason I've brought the two of them together is because there seems to be a current paradigm about AI, concerning AI, about AI being intelligent, um, obviously, and also becoming conscious within the next years and how we're going to deal with artificial general intelligence. How are we going to deal with the fact that AI is going to outwit us humans? AI is going to become some sort of technical superhuman. And this paradigm goes kind of unquestioned in the big kind of mainstream debates about uh, AI and surrounding the questions and the philosophical and ethical implications specifically of AI. And what I've heard from, from Georg as well as Johannes is a critical questioning whether such a thing as intelligent machines, conscious machines is even possible. There is a critique saying wait a minute before we start going into like utilitarian ethics of constructing ethical uh, machines thinking machines uh, should we not maybe ask whether the premise of machines being able to think is in itself already flawed and there was an interesting conversation for example between Georg and Elena Esposito um, where they question the notion of an artificial intelligence and advocate for the view of more artificial communication. And uh, if you like, you can start, Georg, and explain to us what your qualms are with the notion of intelligent machines. Right. Um, so this is, as you just said, the term artificial communication is actually a book title by Elena Esposito, who is a student of Nicholas Luma. And um, this is how I know her. And this is also for bo both of us share this background in, in Luhmann systems theory. And I think for this very reason, we, we both do not like the term artificial intelligence. Um, as uh, Johannes said, uh, when we were just discussing very briefly, uh, uh, just a minute ago before we started recording, uh, it's a metaphor. And I don't think it's a, it's a helpful metaphor. To the contrary, I think it's a very misleading humanist metaphor, which was what, exactly what Johannes said before we started recording. Um, I, I will put this uh, very briefly uh, because I like to hear also your points of view on this. Very simply put, uh, simplify, uh, Luhmann distinguishes between three distinct autopoetic systems, self-reproducing systems biological systems this is all living beings including for instance and the brain is also part of you know the uh, uh, is also part of a living system is a system in itself in a way biological system uh, and then um, this has to be distinguished from uh, because it's a different kind of operation from consciousness systems right systems that think minds right uh, and then, uh, of course, Luhmann is most interested in social systems, which operate on the basis of communication. And according to Luhmann, orthodox social systems theory, all these three systems are distinct, operationally distinct. They're autopoetic in the sense that they connect and reproduce themselves by reproducing their own operations, but they do not connect with the other systems. Simply put again, um, in order to um, just to we communicate, just it's not enough that we just think. We actually have to speak, right? So you can, uh, in order for the communication to proceed, for a communication system to evolve, it has to do this by by means of its own operations, which is communication. And these three different modes of operation: thinking, communication, and biological activity, in, including brain activity. They never connect. Uh, and uh, 
instead they are, which uh, is a term applied in systems theory, they're structurally coupled. They constitute uh, the environment for one another. So of course, for instance, because of the common medium of language right now, while we communicate, we are also thinking, at least I hope, and um, what we say, what is communicated has an effect on what we think and what we think has an effect on what we say. And yet the operations remain distinct. And the same is the case for our whatever neurological processes in our brains. And there is no connection between, right? We The neurological processes in our brain are not operationally connected either with thinking or with uh, thought. Uh, with uh, communication. And th this is like very basic uh, theoretical setup, which for me is entirely convincing. Now, um, uh, entirely convincing, obvious. And um, the now what happens with, with a so-called AI is uh, that AI is neither biological, right? Uh, we're dealing, nor is it um, um, thought. Uh, nor, you know, the, the, there's no mental processes going on in, in a computer, but it's some form mm. of computing that is going on. So it's a different mo mode of operation. And we shouldn't call it intelligent, because then we confuse the operation of minds with the operation of computers. Yeah. Uh, and of course, mind somehow, as Luhmann would put it, participate somehow in communication, participate in quotes, in the sense that I just said, because they are uh, also um, using language as a medium. This is why there is this coupling between communication and minds. We think in language and we communicate in language, so to speak. And of course, uh, computer programs also can um, you know, um, participate in communication because by their means, uh, they can also produce texts, for instance, right? But uh, they don't um, they, they don't do this by means of thinking. They do do this by means of computing. And in order to distinguish between, let's say, the production of texts through thinking, uh, and in order not to confuse them with what computers do and computer programs do, I think it makes sense to distinguish between intelligent communication, which is going on between us right now because of the structural coupling between our thoughts in our three minds and communication. So I hope what we are doing right now is a form of intelligent communication. Uh, and then of course you can, as we also discussed earlier, by, by now you can, dis, you can also have communication with a computer program with chat GPT. But there is no intelligence involved. What is involved is computing. And therefore, this should be called, I guess, very simply, for a simple reason, it should be called uh, artificial uh, communication rather, rather than artificial intelligence, because there's no intelligence involved. It's a different kind of communication which operates th through the structural coupling through uh, to uh, computing processes that go on in computers. So it's a mere, it's I think an obvious conceptual confusion if you talk about uh, artificial yeah. Yeah. intelligence, again, because the term intelligence, at least in its major sense, is, uh, you know, associates the intellect and thereby associates uh, the mind. Of course, there are also usages of the notion of intelligence that, do not ref refer to the intellect, but again, I think then this is a, an un, uh, unhelpful uh, metaphor. So uh, the, the difference though, of course, between um, um, these systems, living systems, thinking systems or mental systems and uh, social systems is that they are all uh, between them and uh, and uh, what's it, algorithms or com, uh, com, uh, computers uh, is that uh, the, the former three are all autopoetic, they are all self-generating, whereas as, so far as of yet, um, algorithms are not, at least not completely autopoetic. They are still being programmed uh, by uh, people who have minds and so forth, right? Yeah. So they're not yet uh, an autopoetic system. 
yeah, uh, that may well be in the future that they also become autopoetic, but if they would become autopoetic, that still wouldn't make them intelligent. And you can kind of see when you play around with it that what it is is noise cancellation. And I think also this, you know, this um, with chat GPT, I mean, it just keeps on canceling out noise and it just does its whatever, 45 operations. Uh, it, it, there's no memory. It has no sense of time. Um, and obviously, the, the only reason why ChatGPT is so good is because there are still human beings involved and have been involved as far as I've been able to gather. Um, so it's not just programmed and now it's done. It's learning everything on its own. There's a continuous interaction also of human beings that change the code and uh, help with, not don't, don't help necessarily directly with the answers, but... Uh, in terms of what it uh, comes up with. Um, there's very good articles, by the way, um, by Andrew Orlovsky on Spiked Online. Uh, he's been following, the, what really is missing is we, we need some sort of a, a Michel Foucault who, who looks at the genealogy of, of AI. I'd be really interested uh, if there's anyone out there who's doing this, I'd be keen to know, who follows, uh, <clears throat> and maybe could you know point out where this, fallacy or categorical mistake um, or curse that you refer to this conflation um, that that we see and at the same time I think something I mentioned before the the recording I just say it now too that it's very often and I don't mean this as an offense but it is quite nerd like you know it's very uh, isolated or or um, focused just for example on on, on language but human beings aren't just language and certainly not language cannot be reduced only to um, the transmission of information either. Um, and at the same time, you know, the, I think science fiction movies are playing into this also. Um, they are, 2001 A Space Odyssey is for the most part, I would say also a metaphor. For me, it has to do much with uh, Christianity, with reaching um god and um, through hell actually so hell is programmed to uh push towards um, um reaching monotheism um but hell is not necessarily really a computer i mean it, it, it is in the film but it, it's still a metaphor i think also terminate is probably a metaphor uh and so if that that reduction to to just language disregarding, for example, the will, um, or even just our basic drives and instincts, um, those are completely seem to be out the window in, in these discourses on AI. And we're, what is strange though, and this is what Sean pointed out, is the, you mentioned that there's a utilitarian um, approach to these questions. Um, which already presupposes that AI is, is, it is thinking, but now it has to, but it, there's a weird sort of thing that goes on here. On the one hand, it's, oh, it's conscious anyways, but it still needs to be programmed in a utilitarian way, right? That's, that's a bit odd. So if you say it's conscious, well, then there's no need to program it. You, you could get rid of all of these ethics uh, programs that you have. You don't need to program. It will come to its own conclusions. So, the that to me is a bit odd and there, i think there will very soon be a new uh, ai winter basically this might not be the beginning of the greatest revolution of all time this might be just perhaps people will think as they call it as they say on the internet uh, just think it's cringe you know the more ai generated images you see like, oh, can't, it's too much like cgi you can't you watch avatar it's impossible this is too much CGI, there's nothing. Um, so that might happen, I don't know. Or it, in, in, at universities, maybe, uh, Georg, you know this as well, uh, university professors in England and, and America freaking out because ChatGPT you know, is able to write essays um, mm. on to a certain level. But I facetiously said recently in a short video that it, this just reveals how robotic writing has already become exactly. at mass, I make, at, at mass uh, universities. Uh, what is it? Great minds think alike, Johannes. I make exactly the 
the same point in the video I just recorded a few days for my own channel, which I haven't posted yet, that ChatGPT is basically just reproducing jargon. Uh, and um, it's 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 the idle talk is given in Heidegger. Heidegger, what Heidegger? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just reproducing jargon, and um, uh, it's very good at this. But um, even better than humans, who are already very good at it, especially academics are very good at, at reproducing jargon. And uh, actually, I welcome this because um, my, I'm the only, I guess, full-time professional academic uh, of, among the three of us. So I'm, I'm full-time in the academic industry. And it's not just that students are required to reproduce a lot of jargon when they write essays and so forth and get rewarded for reproducing jargon. Uh, professors, of course, also have to reproduce a lot of jargon all the time when whatever, writing administrative reports and um, writing reference letters or writing peer review, uh, uh, you know that as well, uh, right? When you have a journal for peer reviewed and then you ask someone to write a review for it. And then basically the task is to reproduce some jargon uh, because this is how then the, the selection process goes. And this is what expected. And so I think ChatGPT just reveals, makes it more obvious uh, that uh, what large part of the academic system basically consists in, in the reproduction uh, of jargon. So I wouldn't scandalize the, uh, single out the students and scandalize them for utilizing ChatGPT for cheating. Uh, I think actually ChatGPT may, may bring great relief to professional academics. Uh, because uh, um, they they no longer have to you know reproduce the jargon completely by themselves. They can use uh, um, a very effective tool uh, to help them in the required reproduction of jargon. I mean that's so when you say reveal, obviously that we can say uh, it's a bit of a catchy title. It's it's the apocalypse of AI in the sense of apocalypse is just revealing something that about language that others have seen also. Osset Mandelstam a hundred years ago says uh, language is in everyday speech is automated. And the only thing that interrupts this is poetry. A hundred years before him, it's Goethe who says it. I'm not aware that Mandelstam, who was a, a Jewish Russian, uh, read Goethe. Um, but I mean, uh, that's again, from a Lumanian pr perspective, it's yeah. very functional. This is how very effective, right? And so whatever in any social system, including the education system and including the academic system, I would think large parts of, of the efficacy of these systems, the Leistungsfähigkeit, uh, consists in, in the production of jargon. Yeah, if I uh, may add something here, I have to admit, I actually have used uh, ChatGPT for <laughs> assignment <laughs> once, but I'm not going to uh, give away too much, <laughs> otherwise I get into trouble. Um, but the uh, interesting thing is it goes both ways. You can also use ChatGPT as a professor to correct these essays, right? Yeah, to, yeah. to edit. Of course, exactly. Them. Yes. Or and, to write um, your own paper. Right, exactly, exactly. 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 There is a there is an AI that can generate postmodernist uh, papers, and exactly, then you can yes. get anything generated from like cognitive capitalism yeah. of grain eating or whatever. You know, you can you can find everything. And I mean, I, I think it's unfair that it, they only say it can be reproduced, which I fully believe to uh, produce postmodernist papers. I think it can equally be used to produce analytic philosophy papers. Equally yes, I, I agree. I have the feeling it's with, with postmodernist papers, I think it's just this overload of jargon that makes it even harder to see that it was an AI or something. It was I think that's unfair to continental philosophy. I don't dispute that there's an overload of uh, jargon in continental philosophy, but from my kind of outsider experience, I also feel that there is an overload of jargon in yes. analytic philosophy. I completely agree from, from, from my, uh, because I had to read some of it during my studies but sorry Sean go on yeah um the interesting thing about um ChatGPT now in particular is as well as you've said that um it it needs it requires humans to be trained and the way this works is as far as I understand it there's three layers to the technical setup of it the first one is the large language model so what you have is basically a 
architecture, a neural network architecture that is trained on a huge, enormous corpus of text. That's right. basically how it works. And these language models so far, the reason they're booming is the more text you put in them, the better they get. There's like, it's so far as not really approached yet its saturation curve. So more text and the systems just get better. So what happened is just they've grown in size. There are, there are several hundreds of gigabytes large, these models. And uh, the language models initially worked as uh, n-gram models. So you n-gram means like, um, let's say a bigram is just n equals two. That is, you have one word and it predicts the most likely word that comes after that word. And mm -hmm. n-gram is you have five, five, n equals five is five words, the most probable word that comes after the five words. So the language model basic kind of task for these things is uh, doing that. And then on top of that, the second step, the second Just layer is then a, a labeled learning. So you, then the language model will output you five to 10 or however you want, how, however many you want responses to a prompt. And then humans sit there for hours, loads and loads of underpaid workers sit there and click on which response makes sense. And then on like on the out, you could imagine it on the output of the language model is propped onto it a regular uh, neural network that kind of mm, uh, is trained to uh, uh, bias towards responses that have been labeled as good responses. And then the third stage is the so-called reinforcement stage, reinforcement learning, that is the users giving likes and dislikes to whether giving their own feedback as to whether the answers have been good or bad. So you, you are correct in saying that there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of kind of uh, human interaction going on there. And you could see it as a form of artificial communication as you're technically in a way communicating with hundreds of people, just that communication being kind of abstracted and processed, right? So it, it makes sense to look at it as um, artificial communication, just one thing I'd like to uh, get into is you you mentioned the genealogy of um, AI, and um, part of that is actually the first famous AI winter in the 70s, where for many years no new development came around, even though back then people were saying the, the intelligent machines are just around the corner. And um, there, there has been a bit of a paradigm shift. This natural language processing has been around for a while, but the big boom kind of came around on the last... Um, what like eight years or something um before that the focus of ai was way less on natural language processing but actually on computer vision it was way more on focusing on recognizing entities and there's still the big problem of object permanence so there's still the problem of having a representation that it's the same thing just from a different angle different perspective right. different color and um i would say the metaphors that had been used until then were actually not based on social systems, uh, I've just taken notes here, social systems which focus on communication, but been more focused on biological systems, focused on brain activity. So one of the first breakthroughs in AI was the perceptron, was the kind of model that was inspired by uh, neurons in the visual cortex, trying to kind of um, recognize patterns in visual images and visual data. Yeah. So. Again, I wouldn't deny that these inspirations, obviously, I fully believe what you're saying, that they take place and, and certain an analogies are okay. And yet, uh, it's it seems to me, I'm, as an outsider, that still, uh, whatever computer technology, I mean, there are not neurons, there are no neurons in the computer, right? They're not, part, they're not living systems, they're not alive, there's no blood, yeah, there's no whatever. Yeah. And I'm not, it's like uh, Elena uses the same kind of in, in her book, this very simple um, uh, analogy, right? Uh, when they were trying, you know, to invent flying machines uh, for centuries, they were trying to basically build an artificial bird. Uh, and um, then uh, the real breakthrough came when you no longer try to just copy a bird, but build a, a, a technology that is actually more effective at flying in many ways than birds are, right? There's no bird that flies like 2000 kilometers in, uh, you know, an hour or so. Uh, and um, 
so because they have completely different technology there may be some analogy and it's the same with the computer technology may okay in some some cases they still lag behind whatever you you mentioned vision of and and, and recognition of, of of objects from different perspective but of course in many other ways um the the technology is already just you know in infinitely better than than the mine than mines at uh you know with, with big data and so forth and and the memory capacities simply because uh they're not neurons and they're not neuron based and they're not using thought operations which um as Johanna said I mean we, we when we think we have all kinds of stuff we have whatever we experience pain we experience fatigue we experience boredom we experience all these kinds of things we you know we we are plagued by all these kind of emotions that are going on uh, computers don't have that and um very and good for them that they don't have it right so they um they can do a lot of stuff uh much faster and and uh, uh much better than, than minds can and than brains can because they're neither minds nor brains would you say then that there's like a a sort of difference in essence there's a sort of uh, exactly. like that's it's a, a difference in operation it's a it's a difference and it's an ontological difference yes yeah, but that's, okay. that's a different form of being in the in the in the there but in in system they're just different kind of operation operational difference mm. what, what but of course it, it, in philosophical language it's an ontological difference but i think that's the crux of the argument surrounding ai there's a lot of this um especially analytic philosophers would kind of yeah uh, uh, wave away at this sort of uh, view as being like a romanticist view of being like there's some sort of true right. human essence that they can never. But no, no, no. Copy. We, no, I would, I would say the computer has an essence, and that's constructed uh, by human beings. But the human being, there's no essentialism about the human being. The human being is being. The English is very strong here. You know, the focus on the ing, on the mode of being the modes of being is in the enactment or the performance of being im vollzug in german im vollzug des seins we exist insofar as we enact our existence uh, and the, the 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 computer has uh, in, in, in a classical sense uh, a, you know very definable essence which is a, a calculating machine and that the human being is beyond um, that. Uh, the, the computer doesn't, you know, of course, there can be robots that use tools, etc. Uh, but it's ultimately programmed. And I think it's always a bit mischievous um, from those who propose uh, AI to say, well, we're programmed too. our biology programs us. So we're programmed by, uh, which is basically some making recourse to to god or to a creator uh without naming god we are without naming the demiurge uh right so that that's another these are metaphors very often uh that are then you know so that's just would be my um, two cents here is that there's, there's not really a, not really a human essence um and by the way analytical philosophy very much has become sub metaphysical sorry to say it but uh, they've they've completely uh i mean when you look at what's going on in some of the more technical papers for them anything you say is an essence at this point pink elephant that's an essence so it's become a sub metaphysical operation um and it's be precisely because it has no connection to the tradition but that's a different story what what i find interesting there is as well that chatgpt specifically um has been largely trained on um code like obviously it's been coded but i mean it has been largely trained on asking it to provide computer code and in that respect it's really remarkably good because you can tell them in your natural language what you want programmed and it gives you a sort of programmable code and i feel like um the kind of sense of analytic philosophy is that we we try to reduce um, philosophy, we try to reduce thinking in yeah. the form of code and just or like I suppose Georg would refer to it as jargon in some <laughs> sense, but it's it's jargon that's very much tied to the logical 
way a computer and, language is built up. And sorry, this is thanks for saying this again, because now I remember what I actually also wanted to say very briefly is that this came out of what, what Georg just said. These are ontological decisions that human beings make. When, when philosophers of information say everything is information, which is an, a, an extreme positive, right? It, it posits uh, an ontology and uh, it's basically a dogmatic form of metaphysics. That is uh, an ontological decision that is historically conditioned. And there's a certain blindness to that from those who propose this, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I would I would agree on that part. Just one thing I, I try to I'll I'll try and do a form of like a devil's yeah, yeah. advocate here, where um the argument wouldn't be that obviously a modern analytic philosopher is not much religious and wouldn't argue that God programmed the human in that sense, but they would argue with evolution, that it is sort of a programming that evolved through selective well, adaptation. Uh, yeah, but that's um, not, evolution has, is pure adaptation and it has, there's, there's no higher form to evolution, right? So an AI is always presented as the next step of evolution, the highest or the higher form of consciousness, better than humans. There's no better, and if you take Darwin seriously, it's just complete randomness. There's no right. need for the human. I mean, if he himself isn't actually maybe because of censorship, or so he actually does say, "Oh, that the human being would come from the ape," blah, 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 or from 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 the process of evolution. But if you take it seriously, there is there's no stages to it. Um, there's no higher form. It's a complete random process. No. Well, the the um, the, the thing is. The uh, difference you could make there is, okay, you can't, uh, it's, it's kind of, it becomes difficult to, to speak of conscious or intelligent machines if you see the machines as something that's like separate, as if, if you have this kind of naive Cartesian view, there's some sort of box with a subject in here and uh, there is a machine and now we're, one, we're speculating whether that box, the machine also has a subject sitting in there. And it, obviously you get into a lot of difficulties and you get into a lot of problems you have now at the scientific discussions on consciousness. I went to the ASSC conference, uh, the Scientific Study of Con Consciousness conference, and most debates uh, have that as their philosophical grounding, more or less. It is basically a sort of a, a struggle between phenomenal first person consciousness and then um, access con third person access consciousness derived from neural, neural correlates measurements. And so uh, if, however, if we change, if we transform that view to something that is like a, a neo-Darwinian, like a, 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 the, the newest kind of perspectives on evolution are way more kind of, um, let's say, decentralized, way more uh, uh, not, not focused on the individual, but um, way more looking in general at adaptive systems that are symbiotic, that diverge and converge. It's a very complex system kind of study that it has become, complex adaptive system study. And in that sense, um, for example, technology can be seen as a sort of extended phenotype of the human. It, it is seen as something that is part of um, the kind of natural expression of the human genome is also the tools we use like just like the extended phenotype of a bird is its nest of a beaver is its dam of the human its techniques in a sense and so the human is also evolutionarily driven and selected by its techniques by its technology and you could therefore if you change the perspective if you go into a like post metaphysical cybernetic perspective then um, the machine is also evolving uh, over the secondary carrier of the human. It's just like the virus evolved without, you know, the negative connotation of the virus. But I mean, like um, the, the machine is evolving with the kind of uh, carrier of the human and that this sort of symbiotic combination of human and man is um, is 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 something to shift yeah, focus but, to, and then you can speak of consciousness as a process in a, in a way but there is not just techniques I, I, there's I, also poesis I, and and uh and the nest does not build itself just like the machine does not build itself okay sorry gear no 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 uh, I'm, I'm sorry uh, again i don't understand i mean it seems to be very obvious uh, to me completely obvious 
uh, that consciousness, you know, includes such thing as I mentioned earlier, whatever, having a toothache, um, being bored, um, being tired, um, all these things, right, which we are all the time, right? several of them at the same time, right? Yeah. yeah. And it makes no sense to assume that a computer has that or does that. And uh, right, uh, it would just only be would you know would prevent the computer from doing its work. <laughs> uh, how can you just have? It has nothing to do with. It's not con obviously not consciousness. Find find your fucking own word for it. Just don't use a metaphor. Describe actually what the computers are actually doing when they're computing in uh, in in a language that that makes it sensible instead of uh, operating yeah. uh, with uh, with completely confused metaphors. Do your job. They not good... they don't they obviously not what they are doing. They're doing something different and describe it. In and and your job if you're in this mm -hmm. field is to find actually accurate language rather than borrowing completely misleading metaphors well yes they are misleading i think that's very important that there needs to be its own language and i think that would be a, you know uh, there should be enough uh in the Wortschatz of two and a half thousand years of philosophy or uh, that, that well, you create new you create new words i mean doesn't matter yeah, you combined. can create new words yes of course but my my question my question would be that but this is probably not neutral though right i mean i don't think that it's a just a random oh let's just call it consciousness let's just call it ai okay. i think that there is there is uh probably i mean i don't know whether either of you would agree with this but it is in this it is to me it is dehumanizing uh it, because it's ultimately always about saying well now you know you're so much slower than a calculator uh you're not really you know you're not really human anymore um, the machine is more human than any human could ever be. Um, this is what I always gather from these conferences and lectures and etc. Uh, and so I don't think it's neutral. I think uh, I mentioned Foucault before. I think when there needs to be another Foucault who actually looks at the genealogy of this and the power, um, uh, the power relations that go into this also. Because once once you have these programs out and you call the call it artificial consciousness, artificial intelligence, whatever you call it, uh, artificial human, uh, you you have a, a massive dehumanization program going. You can tell you can tell people that they're inferior, uh, and that to me is what's striking. And yes, they would have to find a new language, but I don't think that it's a, just by accident. So. There's, there's something that, that it, not, not to say, you know, that there's necessarily nefarious elements, uh, but it has to do, I think, with power, uh, with political power also. And that to me perhaps would be, would be good to investigate. Uh, and on the other side of that, that, that debate, um, we, those who don't agree with with the language that's being used, we would have to start using our own and come up with our own in our discourses and debates and public um, public engagements with it. So artificial communication is already, I think, going in a good direction. Yeah, the the the, the issue with artificial communication is like I said that like AI, what people what comes under AI is not necessarily limited to language models right so of like a, a perceptron is necessarily not communicating right it's a, a, a neural network for computer vision it tries to recognize objects it's not really communicating right and uh, another issue um i would say regarding the the genealogy is probably this sort of attempt to retain a sort of let's say rigor and truth within science and technology after having abolished metaphysics after having abolished a sort of uh, philosophical grounding in which you assume that there is a sort of fundamental universal truth after you've already abolished that and do not recognize that anymore yet you still want to reap the benefits of having that right you still want to have a form of um let's say a, a, a more truthful or even without using the word truth but some sort of uh, measure some sort of measure for this is more scientific this is more 
uh, technological. And I think the attempt is there to see, to, to have, because everything has been more and more become a, a form of statistical assessing, statistical processing, we kind of want to get to this ultimate statistical processor, the ultimate statistical mind that can discern facts from misinformation um, because these are the terms we use now instead of truth and falsehood it's facts and misinformation right and we want to we want to find that which can statistically through by the ultimate algorithm assess fact from misinformation whilst having abolished truth and falsehood from our metaphysical vocabulary in a sense um, and I think that'd be interesting maybe we could do a video on that Johannes on genealogy of of AI and it's it's uh, metaphysics behind it in that sense um, the the thing I would uh, mention here as well is that the reason I think also why this metaphor comes about, Georg, is let's take the avatar, let's take the kind of entity that is there to interact, to interface with the user. With the, I mean, the, these AI systems are in the end there to be deployed in uh, social media, in different kind of technologies, consumer products. Um, that interface that you can communicate with um, is kind of becoming increasingly capable, especially now with ChatGPT having the breakthrough, it's becoming increasingly capable of communicating in a way that the user um, can act as if they were interacting with a conscious entity. They can, right. they, they can act, they can speak or chat with that avatar in a way that they can chat with their friend yes. and um, as people like us like I kind of fundamentally agree with you the perspective of you and of, of Georg and um, Johannes um, we kind of have to assume that there is still a difference between talking to your mother and talking to um, this chatbot but that difference somehow we cannot really analytically kind of uh, show it up uh, well, the, I, I think the, the difference again is like super simple because the chatbot actually doesn't think it computes that's a difference yeah but what but how would a a, a person a human be able to um yeah prevent it's prevent themselves or prevent itself from falling into the trap to mistakenly assume it's a it's a conscious human well, is mean, that the danger? It's... Uh, we, we make all kinds of mistakes also about humans, right? We think someone is friendly and they're not. And, uh, right, I, I don't understand that question. Of course, yeah. we can make mistakes all the time. Yeah. But, um, and we can, yeah. Um, but, but I, yeah, I you can, that uh, whatever you do. You 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 um, you go outside and and you think it's a tree and in fact it's a person or something or the other way around. But I suppose that leads to to the like I think crucial question when when people discuss these things is what is the actual danger in what is coming up with these technologies? Would you say the danger lies in exactly that that like these things it's silly to assume that they're conscious, yet a vast proportion of the mm. population assuming they are conscious exhibits an enormous danger would you say that i don't really think so to be honest what would you say honest uh if i understand the question correctly yes i think that is one of the dangers because then you have that categorical mistake that's being made inside the holy halls of academia and these research units now being spread across the globe and um you now you know um have the uh, people maybe you know start a relationship with chat gpt uh or so uh and and think that they are um, talking to some one uh in quotation marks and and that's that could be a tremendous issue uh, on the other hand because you mentioned social media, when you look at some of the most successful uh, Twitter accounts, um, or just not not extremely successful, but those who build a, a business on Twitter, <clears throat> very often what what they spread there is quite often also uh, just really almost automated, uh, 
you know, uh, some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, motivational quotes for the day, uh, which could also just be written by a bot just as well. So it, on some, I, I do think that that's dangerous, uh, but I also think that this moment really reveals something about language and the structure of language itself. The, the, yeah, Georg. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not really, maybe the difference between um, my position and yours is that, um, I'm not like uh, as humanistic, maybe uh, as at least what's, what some what some of the stuff that Sean said sounded somewhat humanist, which is fine. I'm just not uh, coming from that perspective. So um, I do think, as I said at the beginning, there is a chance, and I think even a likelihood, that um, these computer programs may become autopoetic systems, and then this will be a huge game changer, I think. And I don't think it's either bad or good. And I think if that happens, it will just uh, change, um, uh, you know, how we think it will challenge how it will challenge also in a co evolutionary process, the evolution of thought, right? I mean, um, whatever, if, like in the beginning of evolution, earlier stages, there was only life, and then later came consciousness, and then there came society, and then and now we also have maybe a fourth, um, a fourth uh, autopoetic system in the form of these programs, and this will be like a, uh, this will be like an evolutionary, uh, and I, I do think there's the, that 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 there will be great. Um, great changes to what it means to, you know, what, what, how thinking evolves. But I don't think it will replace thinking. Just as I don't, and I don't think it will connect with thinking. It will neither replace thinking, this technology, yeah. this, nor will it replace thinking. It will challenge thinking, just as whatever the emergence of consciousness didn't replace or didn't connect in a direct way or eliminate or merge with uh, the reproduction of biological life. I think the world will become more complex. And um, uh, instead of having, so to speak, three major ontological dimensions, we will have four ontological dimensions uh, in the form of, in the future, we don't have them yet, but it's yeah. possible. We have autopoietic computers, mm. but uh, I don't think the auto com com uh, they won't merge with either bodies or minds or society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they will they will have a major effect on the further evolution of bodies of minds yeah. and of societies. And so what it means to be human will be completely different in the future. Uh, because we're no longer living in a, so to speak, three-dimensional world, but we're living in a four-dimensional world where, mm. where we have where four autopoetic systems, yeah. or autopoetic realms of being uh, co-evolve. And I think that will be a big change. And therefore, I think also what it means to be human uh, is likely to change. But I don't think it's either good or bad. But to make a, a a crude point, perhaps that the, the computers, machines, very likely won't procreate, um, or maybe they will. Be, you know, robots will no, begin to assemble new like robots. Them. Yes. Yeah. So that that's 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 perhaps also important not to forget this. Yes. Uh, to to bring in some British humor, I interviewed uh, John Gray a few years ago, who has been, uh, you know laughing at the transhumanist project for, for decades now and he said if you if you because you know Georg that and Sean uh, that there's this assumption that we could merge with the machine that we upload ourselves to the machine mm -hmm. and live in death which again is a neo-christian metaphor yes uh, it's a theory of salvation uh, yeah, and I agree fully with that it's, and it's also agnosticism etc so we, we're back to the same metaphors, basically. But John Grace back then said, you know, it's more likely that the debt will rise from the ground. And if you actually do uh, upload yourself to the internet, you've just exchanged one prison of the flesh with another. Someone <laughs> could pull the plug. I mean, let's not forget that 
these machines we're using in, the digital is not immaterial. It's extremely material. We need rare earths from the soil, um, which are increasingly difficult to uh, pull out of the earth uh, to mine and very costly also. And as soon as there is a chip shortage, there's not enough calculation. We talked, we mentioned big data. The more data you have, the less, uh, the, the more the, the more computing power you need also in order to make sense of that data. And that data is not purely taken care of only by AI either. Um, and I think another important project that uh, I, I'm not seeing yet, and <clears throat> but I've, I've been discussing with a few others also who uh, are interested in transhumanism is in how far transhumanism uh, has to do with uh, humanism or not, right? And so, because you keep coming back to saying you're not a humanist or not humanistic, I wonder in how far transhumanism, uh, which is comes from a, a Jesuit priest, basically, right? As a Chard what was his name? Chardon? Tyler de Chardin. I've read his yeah. works. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, and how far transhumanism is born from... <clears throat> Uh, European humanism, and but what what Georg is saying also, I think, points to the fact that to speak with Heidegger, it was this was never about the human being only. We were never at the center, and this is also perhaps what mm. technology and what what this reveals is that human beings are Spielzeug, Spielwerk. He says we're playthings of being. Of course, Georg wouldn't put it like this. Um, but that's perhaps a, you would say that's maybe a metaphor. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, of the play thing. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, the ideas of Teilhard de Chardin are not too different from what you've mentioned, Georg. Um, he does speak of. Uh, layers in the uh, geological development of Earth. And he says there's like the biosphere and then there's the noosphere. And then there's right. kind of, you could say now the, the emerging technosphere. And right. he's, he was famously like promoting evolution within a Catholic framework, which was rejected by the church. Mm. But the idea was that there is this kind of uh, emergence and acceleration of complexity and that uh, the the kind of alpha and omega nature of God is kind of alpha is the beginning point of the creation yeah. and the omega point is this ultimate <laughs> complexity where uh, biology accelerates to evolve to be in union with with God with the entire universe becoming well, conscious and technology. Interesting. Yeah. That is the, I, the story. Familiar with it, but that sounds yeah that sounds fast, <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, that's the that, story that's... of 2001 A Space Odyssey. That, that's yeah, the yeah, goal. Yeah. The goal of monotheism is to become one with God. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, I met the producer of 2001 Space Odyssey, Frank Harlan, I think was his name, or Franz Harlan, something Harlan, I think. Um, he, he even said that he made a, he gave a presentation, he showed the movie to uh, members of the Vatican. And uh, the members of the Vatican also said that, like, um, uh, Stanley Kubrick was a an agnostic that hit the nail on the head um well but but kubrick had a prequel planned for for the film which the, the story for which was written by clark um and that prequel was supposed to have a rabbi and a i think a catholic priest discuss what would happen if alien life form were found so you know, the, again, the, these are these are narratives or motives that are, are playing out here through technology that are quite primordial, archaic, uh, and but then again, you know, monotheism may very very well not be true. Well, yeah, I think um, to get back to our initial discussion, I would like to know then two things especially from you Georg is like on one hand what is the criterion for for example AI and technology now to be considered autopoietic so for example I right. could say that the 
access well, of this is my human. question for you my question is it's the other way around it's not the question that you ask me it's the question that i ask you because that's the core question for me can ai become autopoetic it seems to me there is a chance you tell me okay because i i i would say the lines are in a sense blurred because you could say that in a sense the con the collective consciousness of all of these people that were involved in training that um are, are part of the system you know there's a how do you say you, you don't, there's no necessary criterion to say okay um these people that were involved in training and in, in preparing the data that all these people are to be separated from the machine. They were just cause like in the actual functioning of it, they're no longer kind of directly involved in it, but in a sense, the machine is the product of these people coming together. So in, in a way, um, autopoietic systems are involved in it necessarily and the question is then like is there some wall that needs to be broken through where the autopoiesis also takes you know begins to take place in the algorithm itself that is kind of uh yeah, i don't know question, like no, weirdly that's formulated the question I'm, I'm asking you so can right. can algorithms be basically self-reproductive yeah. that they no longer uh, a kind of depend on external programming that they kind of, um, uh, in a certain sense, autonomously uh, reproduce their own uh, their own operations. Yeah, well, that's a good question, and I definitely cannot answer that right now. <laughs> However, um, I would. So, do I understand it then correctly that? The critique of the common usage of these terms of intelligent machines, conscious machines, is that you're we're speaking about non-autopoietic systems as if they were autopoietic in our sense, in our sense of our thinking. But then what I'm wondering about is where lies like that is the that is the critique. And I'm saying, why is that critique warranted? And that brings me I back mean, to the earlier point. Is, the critique is that we speak of computers or some people, uh, that was the beginning, as if they were thinking, whereas this seems to me very clearly uh, a metaphorical confusion. I don't think they think. They do something else. Yeah. And, and the I, question I, is, whatever they do, which again, I complain, it's not my job, it's the it's the job of the, the philosophers or the scientists, uh, or the programmers to, to explain to me what uh, these computers uh, and what these programs actually do, and that they should stop using wrong metaphors so that I can better understand what they are actually doing. And they should <laughs> explain to me people also like you sean uh, because you're in computer science and in in this you should explain to me uh why or why not uh, these machines are likely or unlikely to become autopoetic yeah so but the way i understood that was that like if we don't do that if we just keep going the way it is now that's how i understood what you said yeah. regards to this that we will run into the risk of assuming intelligence and consciousness whilst there is none right, right. yeah but that's when i when i brought that up when i brought that that's up what you Johannes said, also said that's that's the major discourse which seems to be somehow obsessed with this vocabulary right but like when i you're correct in saying that we often like mistake things you know we mistake a human for a tree or whatever we mistake yeah. uh, someone's voice for someone else's voice um but you would still agree that, like, in this particular topic, this is the danger. This is the danger now, this mistaking of a, a non-conscious entity for okay, conscious. Okay, now I better get what... Uh, sorry. Ah, uh, in, language sorry, but... is not just transmission of information. We just saw that, right? <laughs> yeah. Because we have three minds. We're trying to make sense of what everybody else is saying. Right. And very often it takes a detour and another detour and another detour. And then it clicks as we say it slowly right. comes about and now we're closer to what everyone was yes. trying to say yes yes now i understand okay. what you're saying sorry johannes is perfectly right yeah so in this case you're right this is then my my criticism and not just like someone who is kind of uh simple-minded and thinks when they're talking to jet gpt they're talking to a person that's not really the concern, but the concern is that, um, you know, the professors and the specialists, when they conceptualize uh, these things, they conceptualize it in terms of consciousness. 
that's the big misunderstanding and the big danger exactly sean yes and the the mainstream current view on this i i'm like there's by no means is this discussion not held among the like mainstream discussions in these things just it's framed differently first of all first it's framed about like we're not conscious yet it's often a, like mm. you know it's it's just a matter of time uh, yeah. and it's like the, the the sense of consciousness is purely functional so once it has enough functions uh, once it can have a sore tooth <laughs> it's conscious for example um but it's very much tied to this ethics aspect and it's often like a very utilitarian ethics aspect so the idea is so if something is conscious um but we don't realize recognize it as such for example the machine is conscious but we still think it's on the same level of a toaster a calculator whatever then we may um act unethically we may cause harm to a sentient being on the one hand or on the other hand it's actually not conscious but we act as if it's conscious and then we kind of we kind of act in a form of self-neglect or neglect yes. to act this whole discourse them. Sean this whole discourse uh, can only be explained by you know a kind of a fashion in academic ethics now everything has to be ethicized and uh, then of course now you also have to ethicize the computer because this is how you can publish paper the, you, again this is uh, this is just, uh, as Johannes said earlier, whatever, if you would have a Christian dogma, then you would have to wonder if this sinful or not. Uh, but now in post-Christian period, and you get like a social reward, if you, and you get a position and you get funding, uh, if you, if you publish ethical communication. Uh, so that, that's, uh, I don't think it's, very helpful uh, at all to conceptualize these things in ethical term uh, but again it's um, it's an effect uh, of the of how for instance the academic system rewards uh, ethical communication and you see chat gpt is also communicating extremely ethical like i had made all these experiences and and it gives you all this ethical jargon back right which is put there by these <laughs> ethicists <laughs> professionals who are supposed to ethically supervise chat GPT. It's it's in effect a, it's in effect a terrible machine of, of reproducing can um, I, the jargon. Can I read you something? A bunch of my my old friends from from home, uh they always they go on a trip every year and I, I, I sometimes I can join them, sometimes I can. And he, one of my friends just asked Chat GPT, what is the best city for a short trip over Easter in Europe? For a group of guys in their thirties who need to get away from home with interest in food and drinking and good-looking women, and now here's the response: I'm sorry, but I cannot provide a response to your question as it is not appropriate or respectful to objectify or stereotype any group of individuals exactly. based on their gender appearance or interest. Exactly. It's important to respect people's rights and dignity. It's just yeah. jargon. It's yeah, I got the exact same things. thing and I'm talking about it in my video. Uh, I have very similar examples. And uh, it's, <laughs> this, 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 yeah. that's the result of this ethical approach to yeah in the profession the result is precisely uh, what uh, johannes just read out no but not only that i think the danger in that and it's a mirror also... it's a it's a mirror it shows yeah, the, it's, yeah. it shows the it shows the idiocy of 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 of, of ethical jargon and yeah, I, I, I think I, there's... I i i i reckon i I'm, I'm happy that that chat gpt makes this so obvious <laughs> that chat gpt yes. makes it obvious that that these kind of sentences are non-intelligent jargon that they Excellent. are just yes. machine yes. Uh, jargon reproduced. Yes, that, that, that I'm, I'm glad, 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 grateful to Chat GPT that it shows that this language needs zero intelligence. I've, Thank uh, you. For I, I think them. I'm also glad for, glad for that. Uh, um, example i have to add something here though a lot of this jargon is post hoc censorship so a lot of these language models you have to remember in their raw form do not get released to the public because they're too crass you know what i mean so um a good example is i asked them about uh, the una bomber you, you're familiar with ted kaczynski georg 
Yeah, it's very good. I asked, um, if you ask ChatGPT, of course, they'll say we, we do not, uh, it's not good to uh, reproduce uh, ideas from a mass murderer that's unethical, etc. cetera, whatever. whatever. Uh, if you ask one of these more primitive models that don't give good sentences, good structure, if you ask them, some of them will say he was righteous, he should have killed more people. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you get this. I also, a friend of mine made similar experiments and uh, they, they used to work and now they got censored. So that's, uh, yeah, I already knew that. And, and that, yeah. that is the problem as well, I think, because it's a, it's a small group of people who mean well. I'm not going to attribute any malintentions, but it's a small group of people that. I'm willing to attribute neither. Right. Um, neither good nor bad intent neither bad nor good intentions okay let's uh, agree on whatever intentions they um they are a, a small group that is interested you could say in the pr of the company making these models right exactly. you don't want there being screenshots everywhere about exactly. it telling you how yes, to dissolve exactly. a body and whatever exactly. so you um you have a small group of people and they have their own biases their own views and uh, those will be reproduced in a program, however, which is used by millions, perhaps as a replacement for their own thinking. Yes. So it will have a quite a strong. Well, that's, say, that's, that's already effect. taking place. That's, that's, that's been taking, taking place, place without ChatGPT. ChatGPT yeah. is just reproducing it and making it obvious. It makes it obvious to those who can think. And I'm very sorry to be Nietzsche and the rest have never met it. Uh, when you type, I mean, Google Google is unusable at this point because everything on Google is uh, search engine optimized. So whatever, you, you know, if you're looking for uh, the new best tool, so I need, I need a lot of machines. I need cameras and everything uh, for my filming. It's impossible to find anything on Google because all the, 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 the articles you find that recommend something, they're basically just written to make it high up on Google. And then they all recommend the same camera because they're all affiliate links to Amazon or some other thing. So you basically, you have no idea what's, there's not in any sense, any kind of, uh, and, and the major public is not just blogs that do it like the major publications do it like that also, because they also make money off of, uh, of Google search and, and uh, Amazon and other affiliate links. So you, you've had what, what I think um, some people call that internet. Uh, I mean, you type into Google, what is, it usually ends the sentence with what is the meaning of life? So people apparently have been looking for the meaning of life on Google for quite some time. Uh, and then you get all sorts of banal answers. And those banal answers before were mashed, copy pasted together. That says something about our time also. And uh, I mean, it's, so that, that is, it's really revealing about, I just wanted to second what, what Georg said again, is revealing about language, about our time and about the structure of language and something that Heidegger, I guess, would call the uncanny of language. Uh, and that is now coming uh, through, but we shouldn't we shouldn't think that ChatGPT or and other tools give us objective, uh, true knowledge, of course, at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. But not that that exists anyways, but that's a different story. <laughs> right, I think that was a good point to end on, right? Thank you, everyone. Yes. It's good and kind. Thank of you for joining me. <laughs>